pedigree also. Stephanie Kouroubles is a uh, did a PhD uh, at uh, in Paris at uh, uh, Université de Nidro uh, under the supervision of Pierre Vidal Naquet, very famous historian. And she did her dissertation on Holocaust denial in various countries uh, after World War II. And she's writing a book about that topic, Comparative Analysis of Holocaust Denial in Various Countries and in Various Media also. Uh, she's an ISGAP fellow. She's also um, a fellow um, at the Institut d'Histoire du Temps Présent which I had the pleasure of visiting also and working in a little bit. Um, she also does uh, research at Bar Ilan University. She also lectures at uh, Yad Vashem at the Université Populaire de Jérusalem. Mm -hmm. So a person very well connected, very well traveled, and very well researched, if I may say. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for coming all the way to Montreal to give us this seminar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Fisher. Um, I would like first to thank uh, the university to receive me. It's an honor to be here. After that, I would like to thank uh, ISGAP to invite me to Montreal and his director, Charles Smalls. And uh, I would like to thank you to be here. And um, the last thing that I would like to say with you is if you have a problem with my English, I'm not bilingual like you. So please raise your hand, tell me that it's not enough, you don't understand, and I will back on my uh, sentence. Now, if you have questions about the subject, we will uh, take time after the lecture to, to talk about it. So keep your question for after, okay? So the first uh, uh, question that I would like, the first questions that I would like to raise with you to, to see the issue of Holocaust denial is, um, shall, shall we talk about Holocaust denial? Shall we not just inure them not to talk about Holocaust denial? And it's the first question that I would like to see with you is, is it, is it not giving them the publicity talking about them? So this is a question. Um, to answer to this question, I have to tell you a small story. Is um, I was in uh, in uh, with uh, um, um, sorry uh, Abraham Foxman, uh, the national director of, of Anti-Defamation League in New York, two years ago, and I asked him the questions: How how happened at the beginning when Holocaust deniers were talking about the subject in the 60s? How did you react as an Anti-Defamation League? He told me that the survivor came to him and they wanted to talk with him about it and should, should we react to them or not? And uh, at this time, at, in, in the 60s, they say no, we shouldn't react. We, sh we should just ignore them. But the fact is, as soon as deniers become uh, more, uh, receive more credibility in the public space, we, could, we couldn't anymore ignore them. And this is the point that I want to see with you, is this point here. I don't know if you know about Robert Forisson, it's a French denier, very famous in France. As soon as he received a free article in Le Monde, Le Monde, that is a, the, the famous uh, newspaper in France, as soon as he received a free article where he denied the gas chamber, where he denied the Holocaust, we couldn't anymore ignore them. So this is a point that it's very important to understand now, and I want to go like this. Um, when I want to talk about this subject is not enough, of course, and I am going to talk about different countries and in different times, so I have to do short, and uh, I'm sorry, if sometimes it's a little bit frustrating because I can't more develop, but it's, 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 a, it's a very complex subject, and one hour it's not enough, of course. So uh, I'm going to see with you uh, the evolution of Holocaust denial in the time uh, with a chronology to see different periods. Before to, um, before to do this chronology, I can wait if you want that uh, people are coming. Huh? Okay, so before to do this chronology, I want to give a, a small definition of Holocaust denial. Um, I'm not familiar with the computer, so please, I will try to do the best. So who, 
what, what Holocaust deniers say. They say that um, historian, the Jew, mostly, the alias, and the Jew, Israel, lie about the Holocaust, and they create a rumor, the extermination of the, extermination of the Jewish people, in order to obtain uh, uh, financial help from the Germany, and further to create the state of Israel. It is what they say. Now, uh, uh, if you want, I can see another slide. It's the argument. So I'm going to explain a little bit their arguments. I can't develop because there are a lot, but I try to summarize some of them. The first argument that they have, they, 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 they want to deny the proof of the genocide. So they are going to say the proof of genocide are fake, are second hand. The proof of genocide are in contradiction. They are improbability. This is the first argument. After they go to historian, they say historian misinterpret the, the, the proof. So they focus on historian. And then after they focus on testimonies. They say that the SS, during the um, trials, they, 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 they lie about it because they were under torture. So they couldn't explain exactly what happened, so they lied. After that, they said the witness. The witness are, 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 um, they are with, they, sorry, the witness are with mistakes. So they, they, they mistaken the, um, uh, they, they, they are doing a lot of mistake of what happened. So this is a way to, to deny the Holocaust. After, they, uh, they use different arguments, like it's impossible demographically. After demographically uh, arguments, they use like technically arguments, like it's not possible technically, like the gas chamber couldn't exist technically. So it's another argument. After, they will say people die from typhus, from disease, but not from the gas chamber. Mm -hmm. And they will say that, that the Jewish people are alive, and they are alive in the United States, in Israel, with fake name. And they didn't want to see anymore each other, like the family, because before they were forced to be married. So they don't want to see anymore. So this is the, 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 the main argument that they use. And then after the last argument that I, that I, I can see, is the final uh, solution was not uh, the extermination of the Jewish people, but it was the expulsion of the Jewish people near uh, in the East countries. So this is the main arguments that I can see about Holocaust denial. Of course, there is more than that, and I couldn't explain more, but we have to go on. So after, I wanted to see with you, it's more how we analyze their arguments. And it's a little bit more complex, but for me, I thought it was very interesting to see it. First of all, they have a logic of denunciation. And I can go on on it, but uh, I use the, the sociologue, I don't know if you know, Luke Boltanski. He is a, so a sociologue who works on denunciation, how the denunciation work. And it's very interesting to see that, uh, um, so the denier are the denunciator, and the victim of the German people, and uh, the persecutor are the alias. Mm -hmm. And this denunciation, there has to be, it's very important when you have a denunciation that the um, uh, denunciator is very far away of the victim. So they don't want to, they, the deniers to, to, to have a logic denunciation, they need to say, we are far away from the German people. We are not neo-Nazi. They, 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 they it's needed for their logic of denunciation. After that, we have another logic, is the logic of the prophecy. It means that they're using a logic of prophecy as the way that they are the new prophet. How are they are the new prophet? Because they say, we have a good news to tell you. The good news is that the Jewish people never died. So for them, it's like they are the new prophet. And they use this like, it's a good news. You should be very happy of it. So, and they, and they, and they go on on this logic. Another logic that they use is, as I told you, they use um, the logic of technical arguments. And this logic is very strong for them. And I will come back with it in, uh, in my chronology. But it's very important to see that um, they, they send pseudo-experts in Auschwitz 
to prove that the gas chamber never existed. And they had a famous report on it. And uh, I will come back on it because it has to be with the Zondal tribe, maybe that, the tribe that you know the more here in Canada. So I will come back on it with this kind of report. But it's very interesting to see their um, arguments logic. And a last logic that it's interesting to see, it's the logic of Lampinist. I use in French the, um, the word pamphletaire. And I think it's, it's, um, it's more pamphletaire than Lampinist that I want to use. So I don't know if Lampinist is, uh, is the best way. You have here in, uh, in McGill a professor, it's Marc Angeno. Uh, I don't know if you know Marc Angeno, but it's a, a famous professor here who works on the logic of, uh, prof uh, or logic of uh, pamphletaire. And uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, uh, the deniers um, goes very well uh, go very well in uh, in their um, in their logic of um, of uh, pamphletaire. Uh, and all the pamphletaires use the same arguments. They they say, for example, that uh, they want to see the truth. The truth for them is the best thing that they want to see. It's they they, they research the truth, and it's uh, it's all the pamphletaires are using the same arguments, and deniers are the same as well. And um, uh, uh, Marc Mangeno uh, talk about the paranoia of the conspiracy. And it's very interesting to see that the denier has the same um, logic. They, they, they see conspiracy everywhere, and uh, they see the conspiracy of the Jewish people. And this idea of the conspiracy of the Jewish people, is, uh, it's, um, it's not new. Uh, we have the Protocol des Sages de Sion, uh, in English is the, the Protocol of the Elder of Sion. And uh, now we have another uh, uh, um, theory of the conspiracy. They are blaming the Jews for the 9-11. And uh, so th this conspiracy of, um, of, uh, of the international Jewish people is, uh, is, is, is a link with the past, is a link with the future, and the denarius goes very well inside this uh, conspiracy. Now, what is interesting is like deniers refuse to see themselves inside this conspiracy. They say, we are not like this. We are researchers. We are historians. They want to have a strong credibility. So it's the, it's the way that they want to be accepted by the public space. So this is a, a little bit what I wanted to tell you about uh, the definition. And I hope uh, uh, everything was clear. If you have questions, uh, you will ask me after uh, for this. Now, what I want to see with you is the first, uh, the, the first, I will come back after. It's the, the first time, the first period of uh, Holocaust deniers is the, uh, the beginning of Holocaust denier. And the time is 1946-1973. Uh, so it's, in fact, the political roots of Holocaust deniers. And I will explain to you that it's, um, wh what I'm talking about political roots is because they are funding the Holocaust uh, deniers, the, uh, the Holocaust denier, and the, uh, in the present time. And uh, they show, in fact, the future ambiguity of Holocaust denial. So the first uh, political roots it's, uh, it's divided div 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 in, uh, in uh, th there is th third route. So the first route is ex-Nazi, ex neo-Nazi, extreme right. And the second and the third route has to be with libertarianism. So I will explain to you everything about it. But let's see now the first roots of uh, the extreme right. So we have extreme right, ex-Nazi, neo-Nazi. We have in Germany, Nation Europa, that it's a review. We have Deutsche National Zeitung, it's also a review, with uh, director G. Frey, that it's a uh, neo-Nazi. We have Udo Wallendi, also a uh, link with neo-Nazi. In United States, we have Austin Hap. We have Liberty Lobby, with the director is Willis R. Carto. We have the National Renaissance Party in 1949 with the director James Mandel, and we have the American Nazi Party in 1959. So this is in, in France, we have Maurice Bardèche, and the magazine that Maurice Bardèche has is Défense de l'Occident in 1952, 
and also François Duprat, Duprat who started also uh, denying the Holocaust. So this is the first roots of Holocaust denial, and this roots it's quite simple to understand because they are neo-Nazi, uh, they are extreme right, and what they want is they want to free uh, of guilt the Nazi regime. They want to say that the Nazi regime is not responsible for the Holocaust. They want to deny it. So it's a mix at this time, uh, this period of time, it's a mix between revisionist and Holocaust denial. So I, it's, uh, it's, they don't, um, sometimes they don't deny, they just review. It's, um, it's a mix between the two of it. And um, they want to say, it's simple, they want to say that the Jewish people are controlling the history. And it's quite, uh, um, it's, it's, it's quite easy to understand this roots, root of Holocaust denial. Now, if we see the second and the third, uh, the second and the third roots of Holocaust denial, it's a little bit complicated. So I need your attention about it because it's more complicated and I will try to explain everything. Uh, if I want to come back to the second and the third roots of Holocaust denial, I need to come back to libertarianism. And uh, um, I'm not going to say that all the libertarian became deniers, it's not what I want to say, but some of them deviate, deviate, deviate. So the libertarianism, if I have to say, it's uh, an individual ideology, it's uh, anarchist capitalist, okay? And we have in libertarianism another uh, uh, a left side of the libertarianism is the anarchist egalitarian or socialist. This, this side of the anarchist, it's, they are not capitalist, it means that they don't want the free economic market. Okay, this is a different size of the libertarianism. Now, I'm going back to the, first, the second size. It means the anarchist capitalist. If we see the anarchist capitalist, we, we will say that they want the right of freedom for everybody. Okay, this is the main things of the anarchist capitalist. They will say that they, they, wa they, do, they want to eliminate the power of the, of the state. Okay, this is the idea of the anarchist. Now, coming from this philosophy, this political philosophy, you have the American revisionist historian movement of the first and the first war and the second war. So, the revisionist movement of the World War I and the World War II, the leader of it is Barnes. Okay? Barnes uh, is the leader of the revisionist movement. What we can see with this movement is they are isolationist, pacifist, and they don't want that the uh, uh, United States uh, come to uh, the war. They want, they refuse that the intervention of the state in the war because they are linked with the anarchist capitalist. Okay? After that, they refuse the mannequin of the vision of history. They review the origin of the world. They don't want a vision like manichaeism, like they, we, we have the bad side on the, on the good side. So they want to review it, okay? They want to review also the responsibility of the German people for the war. They want to say the German people are not so responsible for the, for the war. It's not them who start the war. So all this revisionist mm -hmm. movement is very interesting to analyze because we can see that some of them some of them deviate to Holocaust denial. Some of them deviate to den uh, and become deniers. The first one is uh, David Hogan. David Hogan is a very interesting um, denier because uh, he is a doctor in uh, history in Harvard, so not the last university. And uh, also his first book, he published a book in 1971, his first book, what, it was not a, a denial book, but he wanted to see that Hitler is not responsible for the war. It was interesting for him to uh, uh, develop a big controversy in the United States about it. Um, the method that he used was the method of deniers, but again, he was not denied at this time. 
And uh, the second book that he had, uh, I didn't write here, but it's in 1979. The second book is The Myth of the Six Million. And this book was completely a, a, a denial book of the, Jewish, of the Jewish genocide. What is interesting to see with David Hogan is he has been published in, United, in Germany, first his book, the first book has been published in Germany by a neo-Nazi publisher. At the same time, he received for the first time the support of Barthes, Barthes, the revisionist movement, the leader of the revisionist movement. At this time, when we see Barnes uh, give the support to Hogan, we can see that uh, he is deviated to Holocaust denial. Barnes starts in 1972 to deny the Holocaust at this time. So when we see a uh, revisionist historian with a lot of credibility, even if they were polemists at this time in the United States, they are giving to Holocaust denial a big... Um, credibility. After that, uh, we have another uh, historian who become linked with uh, Holocaust denial and is also a libertarian. It's uh, James G. Martin in 1974, who also become after a uh, Holocaust denial and is linked with uh, the revisionist movement. So this is what we can say. Harry Barnes in 1974 denied Holocaust and meet Paul Racinier. At this time, when one meets the second one, we have link between the two libertarianism. So now I would like to come back to the second, uh, uh, the third root of the libertarianism that is more complicated than that. So I need more attention. <laughs> so if we want to explain this third root, it's um, I have to go back to Bordigism. The Bordigism is a, a, a philosopher, an uh, Italian philosopher or politician. Uh, his name is Amodeo Bordiga. And uh, uh, he created the Bordigism. It's a left, ultra left. We call them in France libertaire. Okay? In the, the, the movement of the Bordigism is uh, linked with uh, Paul Racinier. Paul Racine is a survivor, survivor of Buchenwald and Dora. He is from ultra left wing. He uh, come back from the war and he start a uh, um, writing book on, Holoco on the Holocaust. And he start to criticize the literature of the survivor. And he start like this. And then, little by little, he denied the Holocaust by denying the number of the victim. And uh, he gave, um, a, by the fact that he is a, a survivor, he gave a lot of uh, credibility to the movement. At the same time, uh, some uh, um, uh, uh, French intellectuel from the ultra left start reading Ra Paul Racinier and start being very interested by him. They come from the Bordigism. They come from this idea. So how to explain the Bordigism and how to explain the first uh, uh, fascicule that they, um, that they write? It's a little bit more complicated. So uh, the name of the fascicule is Auschwitz and Le, Gr and Le Grand Alibi. Auschwitz and Le Grand Alibi was written in 1970. On, uh, uh, by uh, the group of French intellectuals. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit what they are saying. So, to explain, we have to think, uh, for us, we have a difference between democracy and fascism. Okay? For us, there is a difference between the two of it. The difference between democracy and fascism, it's Auschwitz. This is a difference for us, between democracy and fascism. For them, for the Bordigist movement, for inside the fascicule that they wrote, Auschwitz and Le Grand Alibi, they say that there is no difference between democracy and fascism. For them, democracy and fascism is, is the same thing. They don't see the difference between it. So, because they don't see the difference between democracy and fascism, they don't want Auschwitz. 
they want to reduce it because otherwise we see the difference. So they need to reduce Auschwitz because they need to not see the difference between democracy and fascism. Okay, this is the first idea. It's a, it's a schematization of it, it's a summarize, but it's a, a little bit what they are thinking. The second idea that they have is they want the revolution. They want to do the revolution. Workers have to do the revolution. And because there is Auschwitz, because there is the victim, the survivor, workers see worse than them. Because workers see worse than them, they can't do the revolution. Do you understand what they are, how they are thinking? So the way that they are thinking is they need to uh, summarize, resume, uh, they need to reduce the Holocaust because otherwise workers can't do the revolution. It's uh, summarized. Another idea in their mind is in their Marxist logic, logic sorry, uh, it's not possible that Hitler didn't use the workers that they have, that they had, for the war. It's not possible. They, they don't understand in their Marxist logic that they kill the people because they needed for the war. They needed as the workers. So it, it, it was a, a big uh, workers are here. Why they kill them? For them, it's not possible. Because it's not possible, they, they come to denial. Another idea that there is in their logic is um, there is always political falsification. In every genocide, there is political falsification. They want to see like this. So because there is always falsification, why not also the Holocaust? Why not the Shoah? So it's a, a little bit uh, uh, a summarize of their idea. But we have to see that the two roots of the libertarianism, the two roots of uh, um, this uh, uh, denial <coughs> was very uh, important and give them a lot of credibility because they try to see not only as neo-Nazi extreme right, but also like intellectual, professor, historian. So it's, uh, it's, they, they, they are always playing with the two of it, with this side, on the other side, the neo-Nazi, because it gives them respectability. But at the same time, they never hide the fact that they have contact with neo-Nazi, because that creates a big scandal. And deniers like to have big scandal. So one of the last uh, uh, that I want to talk is uh, uh, Pierre Guillaume. Pierre Guillaume is, um, is uh, um, the director of La Vieille Taupe. La Vieille Taupe is a, a review and it's also a library in France. And it's him who starts to publish all the all deniers in France. And uh, he, they, be, they become uh, very famous in France. I have to say, as the same thing that I say for libertarian, not all ultra-left intellectuals from France or from another country became deniers, of course. And uh, it's just some of them were very strong opposite to it and expressed themselves in the newspaper to say we are against it. But some of them deny and deviate to Holocaust denial. What we have to see, it's like I'm going to change soon, of the, but I'm staying with this idea. Um, between the two wars in Israel, like uh, in uh, 1977 and 1973, anti-Sionism become, became more stronger. The fact that the anti-Sionism became more stronger, Holocaust denial was also more stronger. The fact is, as soon as we can more criticize Israel, we can also more criticism the genocide, the Jewish genocide. So at this time, the anti-Sionism become more stronger and Holocaust denial as well. We have to see that Paul Racinier uh, died in 1977 and Harry Barnes died the, the, the year after, in, 1970, in 1978. The fact that two spiritual father 
of Holocaust denial died made um, the new Holocaust denial the, a new uh, Holocaust denier could come, if you understand what I want to say. Holocaust denial used Barnes and used Racinier as the two father, spiritual father of Holocaust denial. And for them, they are their support because one is an historian, a famous historian, and another one is a survival. So they give them a strong um, credibility. In 1979, so the book of uh, uh, David Hogan came out, The Myth of Six Million, and it's become the best, the, base, the basis of Holocaust denial, of uh, denier's arguments. And it has been published by Willis Carto, and Willis Carto is a very famous anti Semite in the United States, one of the famous anti Semites. So after that, we come to a new uh, period of Holocaust denial. It's uh, uh, a period of the organization of Holocaust denial. After the roots, we have really uh, deniers who came and they bring the frame of arguments. So we have in the United States still Austin Up, we have Arthur Boots, in Germany we have T. Christopherson, William Steglitz, Erich Kern, we have in England Richard Harwood, in France Robert Forisson. So all these, um, all these deniers were, before that, we had revisionist denial. Okay, it was like ambiguous. After that, at this time, the Holocaust denial was clearly deniers. Oh, okay, I, if I you understand what I want to say. I would like to um, uh, draw your attention with uh, three deniers at this time, because it's interesting to see that at this time, Denier changed their communication. They wanted to see themselves like respectable people. They, they want to bring credibility to Holocaust denial. So I want to talk about, first of all, Richard Howard. Richard Howard said that he's a um, professor of the University of London. So even if we knew that Richard Howard is not professor of this university, and his real name is Richard Verrall. He is a member of the extreme right in, uh, in England. He involved a big controversy in England when he started denying the Holocaust. A famous writer is Colin Wilson. Colin Wilson is a very famous um, writer from uh, the generation of uh, Harwood in England. And uh, he has no contact with neo-Nazi. Get involved with Richard Howard to give him his support. And he created a big controversy in England at this time and give him a respectability, of course. Also, another um, denier is Arthur Boots. Boots doesn't need to, be, to claim to be a professor. He is really a professor. He is a professor of a university in Northwestern. He is a professor of, uh, in Northwestern in the United States. He is a professor of um, uh, engineering. He claimed to not have direct contact with neo-Nazi. He also has a book. So uh, the book is well written. He said that he has no contact with neo-Nazi. He said that the over research of the research of David Hogan are not good. <coughs> he always liked Paul Racinier, and he wants to show him as um, he wants to, to say that he he's just interested by the truth, and he doesn't want to uh, uh, claim anything else. He has no contact with neo Nazi again, so and uh, he wants to say that he only research the um, the proof. And he creates uh, the idea that there is two schools. The exterminationist, who is the school of historian, who wants to say that there is extermination. And another school is a school of revisionist. And so by the, the way that he's doing it, and he name uh, Holocaust denial revisionist, he link with the past revisionist movement. Okay. The last one is Robert Forisson. 
Robert Forisson is also a professor in France, in the University in Lyon. He also uh, uh, said that he has no link with extreme right and neo-Nazi. And he also, the university was uh, not showing him like an anti-Semitist. So, um, and he start publish, as I told you in introduction, he start to publish uh, an, a free article in Le Monde, denying the gas chamber, and uh, give a, a, a lot of credibility to the <coughs> subject. He was defended and he received the support of the ultra left, as I told you also. One of the um, uh, supporters was Serge Thion. Serge Thion is um, a, chercheur, a researcher at the CNRS. So he gave him, by his support, a lot of credibility to the movement. And also at this time, because Serge Thion is a friend of Noam Chomsky, they give uh, a, a, an avi who became the preface of the book of Robert Forisson. So for them, it was a success because uh, Holocaust denier could say that we have in her book, in the book of Robert Forisson, the preface of Noam Chomsky. So it's, um, they, give it, they give them a big, uh, 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 an enormous uh, credibility. In 1977, Arthur Boots, the professor of Northwestern, organized a trip in Europe where he meets Robert Forisson, he meets William Staglish in Germany, he meets a neo-Nazi, he meets uh, the English publisher of Richard Harwood with uh, Anthony Hancock, and he's, he also meets a German publisher Udo Wallenby, both are from extreme right. So Boots claimed that he was not linked with neo-Nazi, but he came to Germany and met people who was linked with neo-Nazi. At this time, uh, when uh, we can see, uh, with this meeting, we can see that there is a non-official uh, international movement. In uh, 1979, the non-official international movement become official. The Institute of Historical Review has been created and uh, Willis Carto is the, is the financial uh, support of this institute. They give the first conference at this time in Los Angeles and um, they claim to be an institute of research. The people who came to this uh, first lecture was Dr. Dr. Boots, Dr. Robert Forisson, Dr. App, and Dr. Martin. Uh, you know, they tried to, to, to give to the Institute a lot of credibility. They need for them, they need Barnes as a, a, a spiritual father of the English revisionist. And they want to see themselves like an heteroclite movement, and they don't want to show that they are anti semites They just want to see themselves <coughs> like a researcher who wants to uh, study what happened in history. And at this time, they ask the Congress of the United States to give them proof of what happened. So they want to. Um, uh, to see themselves as an institute of research. And it's interesting to see that at this time, after the um, Robert Forisson, the book of Noam Chomsky, this institute, we had uh, a, 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 like an intelligentsia, an intellectual movement who deviate to Holocaust denial, who start to have doubt of what happened in the past, what happened about Holocaust. And we say, like, for example, Colin Wilson, who supports uh, Richard Aoud, who give support to, to the movement as well. We have in Germany an historian with Ilmut Diewald from the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, who published a book at this time in 1978, where he also gives some doubt about the Holocaust. We have Noam Chomsky. 
1979. There is more than that, but we can see that some intellectuals deviate or had some dudes who were sceptical. And only the fact that they were sceptical about what happened means that the movement, the Holocaust denial movement, give, uh, succeed to something. So now let's uh, see another period of uh, its, its letter. It's the expansion, the expansion of Holocaust denial. I, uh, uh, this this, this um, time is uh, it's a time that there is a lot of success for success for Holocaust denial. They were in the media. They were in different trials. We have trials. Uh, don't look too much about it because it's a little bit complicated. I will explain. We have trials of uh, um, in France, in trials in Germany in Canada, in United States, different trials start with Holocaust deniers, give them a lot of publicity in the media because media likes trials, and also uh, they can show them as a victim. But we can see that this time uh, in a public space it was difficult to organize a jury jurisprudence with Holocaust deniers. We didn't know at this time how to deal with this subject. And for the law, it was complicated. So different trials start, but I have to say that this trial was, at the beginning, was not easy to do. Not easy at all. And I want to take the example of the trial in Canada, of Zundel, because it was, I think you are more familiar with this trial, and it was very interesting how it works. So Zundel is, uh, I'm sure you know about him, I don't have to talk too much about him, but it's, it's a neo-Nazi uh, denarius. He was accused uh, to publish and diffuse wrong information, and by the Canadian law we were able to uh, sue him for that. Two trial came. The first trial was in 1955. He was accused of, uh, sorry, 85. He was accused of spreading false news. Okay, because we have this accusation, he he helped that we needed for the accuser to prove the Holocaust. It means that during the trial, we needed to bring survivor, historian, to prove the Holocaust. In the other way, in a defense. For Zundel, he was able to bring at the court 22 deniers as a witness. So they give a, a, a very strong um, trial, a very intensive trial. He was, um, the trial was very mediatic. Uh, they received a lot of publicity. And also, I have to say that this trial was a fiasco because it was very difficult for survivor for historian to manage uh, with the defense, with the accusation of uh, uh, the Zondel Avoc lawyer. Um, so it, it was very difficult to organize and the, the, the media was very ambiguous at this time. So even if Zundel was accused to diffuse wrong information, they, think, they thought that the trial was not a success. So in 1988, they decided to make another trial, but to do differently and to not accuse uh, Zundel of spreading false news, but accuse of being a neo-Nazi. So it, it, the strategy of the accuser, the accuser was not the same. They needed to, appro to prove that he was anti-Semite. So it's not the same strategy. And we, have the same, um, we had the same trial with David Irving and Deborah Lipstadt in England. And it was a little bit the same the second trial. This trial was easier because we didn't have to prove the Holocaust. It's not that we can't prove the Holocaust. We had enough trial to prove the Holocaust. We have the, the trial of Nuremberg. We have the trial in Germany. We have the trial of Barbie in France. We have enough trial to prove the Holocaust. We didn't need to prove again and to bring Holocaust in trial again. So it's a reason why we didn't want to have the same trial. The second trial was a little bit easier for that. But still, 
uh, Zundel was able to bring in court deniers and he bring also a new uh, expert, I have to say, it's Fred Luster. I'm sure you heard about Fred Luster. He is uh, also, um, he did a report. He went to Auschwitz. In, uh, he took some uh, stone of the gas chamber and he said that with this stone, we can see that there is no gas inside. He, he did like a chemical uh, report. In, during the trial, when he, he, he showed his report, uh, the, 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 the court said that he's not an expert, that we uh, uh, present a new report that shows that it's completely wrong, but still, the Fred Luster report gave a lot of um, credibility to Holocaust denier, gave a lot of credibility to people who were sceptical, like Serge Thion, Serge Thion said, after the Fred, Lush, uh, the Fred Luster report, I become denier. Same thing for David Irving. He said the same thing. He said, after the Fred Luster report, it was obvious for me that Holocaust, den uh, uh, Holocaust didn't exist. So it's, uh, it's, uh, we can see that it's uh, very complicated to have a trial. And it's not uh, the solution um, against deniers. Now, uh, we can see that at this time, we have also uh, deniers who become very famous in new public sphere, like in the university. In France, in France sorry, we have Henri Roque, who for the first time received a first diploma in France at the university on the uh, report of Gerstein, who was the first ambiguous report on, uh, and he was linked with Holocaust denier and also he received um, a first diploma at the university in France. So he made a big controversy of that. In the United States we have Bradley Smith and uh, he also gave a lot of publicity in the campus in the Uni in, in United States. So the question that uh, at this time we raised is at this time of the 1890. How shall we react to deniers? How it's possible to react to deniers because we see that trials are so difficult. So the first idea is, shall we talk with them? And the, the idea is, uh, it's what we use to uh, respond to that is an astrologue can't discuss with an astronome. Okay, this is the point. This is the first thing. We can't, it's, uh, I, I, used, um, I used the logic of Aristote. Aristote said, uh, we can't discuss with someone who says that the, the snow is not white. It's not possible. And it's why Aristote say, and I think it goes very well for Holocaust denier. We can't discuss with them for this reason. Second idea is, if we can't discuss with them, because Holocaust denied, want this, want this discussion, shall we, uh, the press, the review, intellectual review, start to make a conversation, a direct conversation, like in a review. Holocaust denied talk, a review, and after it's an historian. And after we try to do like this, it didn't work. Even if it was at the beginning, where, the, where they are not deniers but just revisionists, it didn't work. The law is not also a solution as we see, but because uh, they give them the, the they, they give them the possibility to say, we have a victim of these trials. We also are um, if we attacked them, it means that maybe we know that we have the, the right, we have the truth. We know the truth. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation with the law. At the same time, in some countries like France, like Germany, we have law in, against deniers since the 80, since the 90. We have law against deniers. So we don't have any more discussion. As soon as we have one who is denying, is denying, and we create a law for that. So um, it's easier, but at the same time, there is a lot of debate on it. So it's a little bit complicated. 
Now, at this period of time, um, historian thought that the best way to answer to Holocaust denial is education. And it's the time that we decide to create a lot of conference, international conference in Europe, to uh, explain more, uh, more uh, to be more educational on Holocaust. And uh, we have to say that at this time, the conference that we historian made was not as was not as popular that Holocaust denial speeches. It's, we have to see that even if historians create a lot of conference, the media was not interested as much as they were interested by deniers. And uh, this is a point that is very interesting, is the, the ro role and the power of the media here is that uh, media are more interested by uh, a man who beat a dog than a dog who beat a man. You see what I mean? So Holocaust denial has a, um, a very interesting aspect for, for the media because we have researchers, historians, as they say, who deny the Holocaust. So it's so shocking that the media take advantage of it. So in the United States as well is the time that uh, historian, institution, start with education, museum, and uh, also with uh, organization who decide to answer to Holocaust denial with uh, brochure, <coughs> with fascicule, and uh, they create a website who is a very good answer to different arguments of Holocaust denial. Now, uh, the last tendency of uh, Holocaust denial is the start in the 80 and it's also in the 90. We, we can see, and I'm going to be in a... It's here. So this is the last tendency of Holocaust denial. We are talking about a triangular, it's okay, red, brown, green. This is the triangular is uh, um, give a lot of polemic now because some people will say uh, it's not a political correctness or it's not the way that uh, we have to talk about uh, um, the link between the three of them. But in all of denial, we can see the three of them. So the red is for ultra left, the brown is from extreme right, and the green is from radical Islam. So on Holocaust denial, a new tendency came with the idea, uh, with, with the three of them. So we can see, uh, first of all, with the extreme right, with the, with the brown, more and more Holocaust deniers became more extreme. It's the new generation of uh, Holocaust deniers. They are more linked with neo-Nazi movement, they are. Uh, they want to show themselves. They call themselves post-revisionist, to say that now it's clear that the Jewish people are um, are controlling leader of the world. So they are more extreme, and they don't uh, as before with Boots, with Robert Forisson. They were more like uh, wanted to to show themselves like professor. Now they are more clear that the extreme right is um, the new generation is more extreme right. Okay. We have also, and I will come back to the uh, the triangular and with the new tendency. But before that, I want to explain to you in 1991, we have a, a, a journalist, a German journalist. His name is Michael Schmidt, and it's very interesting because he went to. Um, he was able to show himself like a neo-Nazi, and he did um, a documentary on uh, uh, a neo-Nazi movement in Germany, and he was able to film a reunion um, conference of neo-Nazi with deniers. So it was like um, not a revelation, but still, it was now uh, we could before. It was ambiguous if Holocaust deniers were linked with neo-Nazi. 
after this documentary that he was able to do it, there is no doubt. And it changed everything because um, now they couldn't, they had to, to see the links with extreme right. We have to see that more and more also at this time, Holocaust denial was more involved with politics. Like in France, um, Le Pen start to be ambiguous with Holocaust denial. Also, this is a time where the last part with the radical Islam. So the first one was Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan start to have contact with denier in the 80. And the, the movement, his movement, Nation of Islam, was linked with deniers in, in 80. In uh, 1985, Boots, Boots from Northwestern, the professor, the, the doctor of uh, engineering, was invited to the conference of uh, Nation of Islam at this time. So the link with Holocaust denial start to be obvious at this time. Again, I don't want to say that all Islam people or Islamic people or all Muslim people became deniers. It's not my point. I just want to see with you that radical Islam movement start to be in contact with deniers. The, um, we had another first sign. It's in France. The, um, the, his name is Warid Gorgi. Warid Gorgi uh, is not here after. Warid Gorgi is a consul of Iran in France. He's working for the consul of Iran in France. And uh, in, um, in 1987, uh, jo a French journalist in Le Monde reveal, 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 revealed, revealed that uh, uh, Gorgi has uh, given financial help to uh, Orgemios. Orgemios is a neo-Nazi organization in uh, France and also a deniers, um, uh, a deniers uh, review, uh, publication. So at this time, we can see that uh, Iran has contact with neo-Nazi in France and also with deniers in France. So the first deniers is Ahmed Khami. Ahmed Khami is from Maroc. Morocco. He is living in Sweden and he created a website, radioislam.org. And uh, he, his uh, website is very strong anti Semite, Islamist, uh, Nazism. He has link with three of it and Holocaust denial as well. We know that uh, Rami has contact with people in Egypt who has contact with Nazi, ex-Nazi. So he is uh, in contact with um, people there. Also in the 90, Rami start to be in contact with all the deniers. So we have link between them at this time. And it's also very clear that uh, Islam is more, uh, radical Islam is more interested by, uh, by deniers. The, uh, the triangular become obvious with Garodi. I don't know if you heard about Garodi, but Garodi uh, wrote, a book, uh, wrote, sorry, wrote a book in 1985. 95. Sorry, 95, thank you. You are following, it's good. He's mixing anti-Sionism and anti-Semitism very strongly, and also uh, denial of Holocaust. And uh, his book has been published by the ultra-left Pierre Guillaume with La Vieille Taupe, as I told you before. And it's, uh, his book is a very success in the Arab world and become very famous. And um, at this time, it was clear that the, our, our Arab world was a very uh, was interesting by Holocaust denial. Uh, in 2000, the Institute of uh, Historical Review, that I told you, wanted to make a uh, conference in Liban, so we can see the contact between the historic, um, Institute of uh, Historical Review and uh, the our, our, our Arab world. 
After that, we have 2006 is the last part of, uh, of uh, this link. It's Erin, who started being interested in by Holocaust denial, who did the first conference on Holocaust denial. We invite all deniers in Erin. They create a center over there and uh, give them a lot of publicity. At the same time, the fact that deniers were involved in Islamic radical Islamists, uh, they lose a, a certain credibility N uh, because uh, we have to see that uh, now they are not independent intellectual. They are linked with Iran, so it's uh, we can see that in one way Iran gives them um, an impulsion, but at some time the credibility changed. So. This is what we can say. Now, it's my last part before question, is to see that... So, when I see the, this um, deviation of Holocaust denial with, anti, uh, with uh, isla ra radical Islamists, I can say that um, they are losing something. They are losing a, a kind of credibility. But now there is new tendency on Holocaust denial on internet, of course, when uh, a worry me that the way that is done, because uh, I don't know if you saw the um, website. It's holocaustdenialvideo.com, and uh, it's uh, it's a, it's a new website, uh, Holocaust denial website. And we show, uh, it, it's, it's really well done. We show inside, they show Auschwitz with the video and they explain how it's not possible that Auschwitz has the gas chamber. It's a, it's a, it's a very well done uh, uh, video and it's very worry because when you see young generation who read or who, who watch this video, they can be influenced by it. Also, we have another uh, uh, Holocaust deniers. His, his name is Eric Hunt, and uh, his website is holocaustdenial.com. And he's, uh, he's taking the movie, the last movie of Spielberg. The, the movie is The Last Day. And he did a movie, is The Last Day of the Big Lie. And he takes uh, all the, the, the survivors the, the, of the movie of, uh, of, uh, of Spielberg, and he show how it's not they are lying, how they it's it's very impressive how it's well done, it's and it's worrying me of course uh, the way that is done. We can see also, and it's my last point, first soon my last point, <laughs> is um, a, 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 a book that we can find on Amazon. The title of the book is Debating the Holocaust, a new look at both sides. This is the book. The book is uh, written by Thomas Dalton, PhD. If you see this book, you can say, okay, let's hear the both sides. But in fact, this book has been published by German Rudolf, and German Rudolf is a neo-Nazi in Germany. And uh, we don't know that, it's not written. But when we see that, we can think that it's both sides. Let's hear the other side. So it's, uh, it's very, um, it can be very, um, it can give a lot of uh, influence to people. The last thing that I want to say is this, is um, when I uh, give a lecture at Yad Vashem, I, I give lecture to professors who come from Europe, England, uh, France, Belgium, and uh, they have a, a problem, they have a lot of problem in school with uh, young students, because they are talking about Holocaust and the students are denying. And they try to speak with them, they try to tell them. But the students are very strong and they deny the Holocaust in class. And they, the, 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 the professor, they, they sometimes don't know how to react. They don't know how to, because there is so much on the internet to show them that they have the rights and they, why not to hear the both sides. So they, it's very difficult for them, and it's very worry for the future. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.
and the Ministère de l'Education disallowed it, and that's what leads to the law against Holocaust denial. What was the title of the thesis and the person I was in France with? It's it's, it's Hog. It's Hog. I talk about it. It's okay. a Gerstein report. A Gerstein report. Okay. Yes. I don't think I don't know I, I don't think you can find my PhD here le négationnisme dans l'espace public. Um, I think that the people who are concerned with trying to remedy Holocaust denialism are not paying enough attention to the psychological domain. And here I'd like to borrow two key concepts. The first is, many forms of psychologists have t tell us that as long as there's a payoff, people will continue to do their behavior even if it's dysfunctional. They're getting something out of it. Which brings me to the second part. About a, a decade or a little more ago, there was a phenomenon called false memory syndrome, where it was discovered that those who were having trouble coping with the present were encouraged to invent a past mm -hmm. which justified their troubles even though it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that that's the problem we're facing with Holocaust denial. That on the one hand, there's the question of traditional anti-Semitism, which is reaped in European culture and in modern Islamic one as well, in the 20th century. Then there's the actual guilt about the Holocaust itself. But more importantly than that, there are a lot of people in the world today who are having trouble coping with the present. The entire Islamic world is in an uproar because of the problem of modernization and the problems of democracy or lack of it. Even in North America, there are the, uh, the many, many millions of people are cons don't understand why it is that of all the different cultural groups, the Jews seem to have prospered and are more successful than most of the other immigrant groups. So they could only think it's not because of their culture or their efforts, it's because obviously the dice is loaded and they're manipulating things. So unless we deal with these psychological things, you can deny on historical truth until you're blue in the face that the claims are false and it will make no difference. Because if they want to believe it, they will believe it if it serves a purpose. So my question is, how do you manage to deal with this? Because in many ways it's not really in our control. No matter what we do or say, they're going to continue acting the way they do because they're getting a payoff from it. So how do you fight this invisible kind of enemy? Okay, as I told you, there is no way to fight. The best way to fight is education. No, but, no. They, but they, 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 as you just pointed out, they look at the internet and they see all the arguments pro and for. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't, no. that doesn't deal with anything. No. In addition to which, by the way, I used to be a teacher, for example, and I had students, some students, who were proud of their Nazi past. No. They, they claim their parents said that Hitler's Mein Kampf was the best book they ever read. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, so how do you, you can't just simply say it's education because that alone they won't do it. No, it's true that uh, when we see with uh, teacher and professor, we try to help them to how to react and to see the methodology of the denials, to show them how they are linked with neo nazi to see, you know, to see. Uh, yeah, but my last comment here, but, but that's complicated. But and the trouble is that the young people today, and then I'll finish, the young people today, many of them, are looking for easy answers. They're not looking for hard, no, long, complicated work. When I talk with professor about it, uh, they say that uh, some of them told me that uh, they managed to, some, some people we will never write, we will never take away their anti-Semitism. 
in, in one way or another, it's not possible. It's generation from generation, it's not possible. But some of them, they will understand that they made a mistake. It's what the teacher told me. Now about the psychological effect of Holocaust denial, it's a very interesting subject because uh, it's very interesting to see uh, the psychology of denials. If we can see them link between them of their psychology. And I come to that because, first of all, I interview in, uh, in Israel a um, famous uh, uh, psychologist, uh, uh, Dr. Fall, and um, it was interesting to see that um, we, we, we try to understand the, the way that they deny on the psychology problem that they can have, even if it's not easy to do it because we are not a psychiatrist, we, we don't have deniers in front of them, of us. But also, um, a new book in France came out uh, from Valérie Gounet, who decided to uh, wrote a biography of uh, Robert Forisson. And through this biography, we can see how she managed to understand and to show the psychology problem of Robert Forisson. And it's a, it's a, it's a well done uh, 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 book and uh, I just wrote an article on it and uh, it will be published in English from, through his gap so you will uh, know more about it soon. Yes. Uh, you just very briefly touched on David Irving and the trial. Sure. Wasn't that one of the successes sure. of people who were trying to deny yes. the Holocaust deniers? Yes. And, did, and what kind of an effect did it have on the subsequent Holocaust deniers and on the previous Holocaust deniers? That's my first question. Sure. And my second question is, were there ever surveys taken, let's say in the recent past, of the four countries that you mentioned generally, the US, Germany, France, and England, mm -hmm. of how much of the population, the ordinary non-professional Holocaust denier population, how much the professional den Holocaust denier uh, 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 propaganda filtered down? In other words, what percentage of, of the U.S. population, German, France, and French, and English population actually are now Holocaust deniers because they, without not because they came to it by themselves, but because they heard the propaganda yes. of or, or or from the internet? Mm -hmm. It's a first of all, David Irving, of course, you're right. It's a very famous uh, trial, and it was a success. And I think after that, it's true that we can see that it's. Uh, uh, like a fall of uh, Holocaust deniers after this trial, and now they don't try anymore to to make a trial because it's David Irving who started the trial, and now they don't dare to do it again because they know that it's uh, it will be it will not be a success for them. And uh, after because it's now obvious that they are linked with anti-Semites, with neo-Nazi, and uh, all of it. So then after it's uh, very difficult to have um, an idea. Of uh, we, we, we know, you know, we know uh, who is denier from the review, from the magazine, from the one who wants to say that they are deniers. But to know how much the population is in um, inside uh, Holocaust denier or is uh, influenced by denial, it's very difficult to say. There are never surveys taken. Though. Yes, okay. uh, I wanted to say about it. The there is uh, we had the. It was like two um, survey in the um, in United States in the 80. Uh, you can find the, the book has been published by the American Jewish Committee on, on a different survey. It was interesting to see that they made two surveys. One was uh, done with the, the way that the question was done was ambiguous. So it was high, quite high. So uh, the, uh, the, the press was, oh, you see, Holocaust denial has a big influence on that. Well, even when you say high, what percentage was it? Uh, I think it was like a, something around 10, something like this, maybe a little bit less. And then, they, because of this survey was not well done, they decided to do another one, and then it was only one or two percent, you know? But the fact is that the media talk about talk about the first one, but they didn't talk as much as the second one because it's a way that to afraid people about it as well. So it's a it's it. It's, except that, I remember that we had one uh, in France as well during the trial of Barbie, but I don't remember how much was it. But 
Um, it's difficult to say because when you see now with the new um, social media and the forum where the Holocaust denier are, they, they try to say, let's hear the both sides. So in one way, uh, doing this, they get involved and they, they influence people. But just getting back to David Irving, I mean, because you didn't mention it at all in your talk, and I was quite surprised you mentioned everything else. Sure. But because I, it had such an impact, and, and, and I would like if you give more details about did it have an impact in, in, in shooting holes through some of the arguments of the Holocaust denial? Sure, did some sure. of the Holocaust deniers mm -hmm. actually go away because of that and mm -hmm. stop writing or publishing or you're, talking? So, you're so completely right. It's just the question of time that I had. And uh, it's the reason why I didn't talk about it, but of course it's part of my book. No, but, but that's my, my question was, it's what kind of impact did it have? In, in lowering, in lowering, I told in lowering you. all about the knowledge. Yes, completely. Yes. But at the same time, in one way, yes. In another way, you can see how we had um, an impact on, in Iran, in uh, uh, how Alakaz denied uh, involved in uh, Arabic words, and uh, you can see that uh, even if uh, it's true that it had an impact, it, it's it's not uh, stopping Holocaust denial. Yes. We talk about uh, education. That, um, perhaps one element you didn't mention is the effective power of uh, survivors who speak to, especially to young people, which is something I've witnessed quite a bit. You mentioned uh, the last days, and I think it's important to note that one of the five people profiled in the last days is sitting at the table with you now, uh, and I'll be interested to see how they debunked uh, another story um, in the other movie. My question, though, is, uh, is there a historical precedent of another event uh, that has this kind of denial which can be uh, linked in any element of a parallel. What, can you Is there some other historical element that, that carries this, that has stirred up this kind of denial uh, of, a, of the historical element? Sure. We can, we can trace as, as a parallel to, to this story. Sure. Um, do you want to talk about survival or just... Uh, just uh, as you, as you that, prefer to. No, 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 just... Uh, because it's not me who has to talk about how it felt so big, or it's not, it's not me, but... Uh, I mean, more as if, because you were talking about techniques of what is, edu that education no, is... No, no, uh, uh, one of the best things that has been done uh, on, uh, about so big, or as an um, uh, institute of uh, Spielberg, who did, uh, 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 since the 80, or maybe in 85, maybe, the end of 80, he started the foundation of uh, Spielberg, and uh, he, he interviewed all a lot of sort of thousands of thousands. No, but that's not his question. His question is: Is there another topic? After, I, I'm sorry, sorry. He, he asked me about the river before, and then after I was talking about that. But is it uh, so? So this is the way that uh, I think it's uh, the best answer to Holocaust denial. Of course, it's to show uh, the testimony of survival, but it's not the only one because we have uh, so many other proof that only witness. We don't have only witness to prove the Holocaust. We have the plans of the gas chamber. We have so many other proof. Now, about uh, different uh, denial. Of course, uh, there is different uh, denial. We have the denial of uh, genocide of uh, Turkey. That's uh, where it's another denial. We have the denial of uh, genocide of Tutsi. It's another denial. So it's not the it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same. How can I say? It, the, this is not the same. Um, uh, um, it's not the same. It's, it's not as strong as uh, Holocaust denial is, but at the same time, and it's not the same denial from, uh, for example, the, the Armenian genocide, because it's done by a state, and uh, and um, the the genos the Holocaust uh, um, the denial of the Holocaust is done by people. So it's not the same way to do it, 
but at the same time the logic is the same they just deny a, a genocide and they will say the same uh, idea like uh, the number are less they will say uh, the crime was not done by or you, you see what I mean but after that we try to see um, we try to use um, Holocaust denied for different, uh, for other uh, uh, events, and it's, it doesn't work. It's not the same thing. It's, it works for when we want to deny a genocide. Yes? yes I'm going to follow from that thing directly. You just trace the evolution of a historical, atrocious historical genocidal event that I think is, is unique from, from any other. Now, we, we do not have the same follow-up from other events, whether we're speaking about dark, or at least not yet, or, or uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, or Angola, or, as you said, the Rwandan Burundi. It's not the same. Maybe you have the, the first generation, the first wave that we spoke of it, about the, uh, the anti-Semites, the far-right people, but these people are simply trying to cover their tracks. These people are trying to exonerate themselves and push forward their political opinion. The Holocaust, the Holocaust denial movement started, may have started off as that, as people trying to exonerate their, their ills, the ills that they've committed to society. But it transformed, it morphed. It became first an intellectual movement. It became fashionable to become a uh, Holocaust denier at some point is here. What's your question? Uh, I, I just, I'm, I'll get to it. Okay. But, um... And later it, it seemed to become one with political uh, implications, mm -hmm. where parties would use, would sure, use sure. Holocaust denial for the purpose of anti-immigration policies to, to, push, to push those forward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my question is, what do you think will be the, the, next, the next historical event? L let me put this in context. We have those atrocious events, but the Holocaust becomes more of a historical event that can be likened to the Civil War or French Revolution, one that is subject to revisionist history. All of the people are, are dead from that generation. They can move on. You, you disagree? Uh, no, I don't disagree. Uh, I just don't know. So it becomes... My question, your question it, it, is... My, my, my question's coming very quickly. So it can be more likened to other genocides. It's actually closer yeah. to closer to a major historical event, and, and it deserves it deserves that that um, reputation. So my question is, which of the which of the genocides that we've seen, in, and we've seen so many? You mentioned Turkey, the Turkish atrocities against the Armenians. Uh, which of the genocides in the past? Um, hundred years, the past century, the decade of atrocities, um, is most likely to follow suit and, and take on this type of political, intellectual um, evolution, where it actually becomes you, you, you because this this is very unique. The no, we discuss it. There's no. There's Historian no, look the past, but it doesn't look the future. <laughs> it just it is, I see. Uh, it just shows, it shows how important a, a historical event this is. This, this has formed the intellectual basis for all of the far-right parties in, in, the, uh, in Europe. You, if you see, for example, if you compare with the, um, the Holocaust, uh, you know, the denial of the Gen Armenian genocide, mm -hmm. he came, uh, he came uh, before, you know, because the, the state starts. So the, 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 the denial of this uh, genocide was at the same time, but um, because it's not the same denial, it's not the same people who denial, it didn't have the same uh, impact, or except it, that. Uh, it didn't receive the same publicity, so it apparently does not she, impact. It does? It, it's not as important as a historical event. It did not shape, it did not shape the formation or, or how do you say the political future of an entire continent as as the whole it did, it did for, for the genocide Armenian genocide yes a the lot whole of intellectual continent? was involved a lot of country was involved in this no, I think I don't know I don't, I don't know what to answer.
Uh, all the major denials, the, the names you listed, unless I missed something, oh, they seem yeah. to be men. They are men. Is that oh, significant? Oh, no, no, there are some uh, and women. girls. There are women. And, so, uh, in Swiss, and many Anglo-Saxon names. Uh, yes. Also, yeah. So, no, not so, not so much, like two or three. But maybe like men. It's Swiss. a male thing. Yeah. I don't know. Yes? I have a I have a quick question. Um, I know that the, the Nazi archive was opened some years ago. And has there been information that's been gleaned from the miles and miles and miles of archives of uh, Nazi um, documentation that in any way says absolutely this happened? Uh, we don't need more archives to prove the Holocaust. That's for sure. We have enough to prove the Holocaust. Now, but I'm asking about specifically not witnesses and not this, no. I understand. But from I understand. The official Nazi no, or, yeah. I understand. We have enough archive. We, you go in any uh, a big institution like uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington or Yad Vashem, and uh, you can see the archives. And uh, we have enough now. Uh, more and more, uh, the Russian uh, archive open, and uh, more and more. And more and more we discover, of course, we're still laughing that we discover. And um, the historical uh, events or details of uh, more in you know, where, Gashamu, where, and etc. But we don't need more proof to, to prove the Holocaust. I, I, don't, I don't think that we need proof, but if they say that this witness or that witness, but if the, Nazi, if the Nazis themselves said we, we were perpetrators, yeah, yes, but for them they will say that uh, the neo-Nazi uh, will, um, they, they, their weaknesses were done with uh, torture, so it was the lie. For them they say, for denial they will say, oh, it's not enough. Okay. Yes? I have an answer to one of Sorry, the yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes, I was wondering, in the current situation, where a lot of Holocaust denial is now occurring in the Middle East in countries where there's not either strong American or, or Jewish interests who have a certain amount of influence. So what is currently being done to try to stop Holocaust denial in these countries where the traditional means I understand exactly what you said. In France, for example, we create a website the name of the website is Aladdin Project, Aladdin. And it's a website uh, uh, created by the Foundation of Shoah, that it's uh, the main foundation on, uh, in France. And they decide to create a website to answer uh, to our call deny in Arabic uh, language. So it, it was done in, um, before 2000, maybe around 2000, and it has a good success. So it's uh, one way to do it. And, uh, um, more and more, I think things like this will, uh, will be done. And, uh, for example, I have an example in France, but uh, yesterday or the day before, I don't. Yesterday, uh, Iman, I I I Iman? Iman came to Yed Vashem from France to know what is uh, Yed Vashem, what is the Holocaust, and it's a way to, to, um, to reduce this kind of uh, propaganda. Okay, guys, I want to thank our speaker on behalf of Thank you very much on behalf of Ms. Gap and Professor Charles Asher Small.